now again. Welcome everyone. I'm very excited to start this workshop or like second start, thanks to those amazing uh, Rishi's uh, bash refresher. Um, this is sort of like uh, my baby because it was it started with this very ridiculous um, tweet when I just asked of like if people would like to uh, have something like a KMO workshop. And I got a response from Rishi in six minutes. <laughs> from a tweet, six minutes it took Rishi to to uh, get on board. And over the next two days, uh, most of the people that are actually actively participating in the organization then joined. And thanks to Jose's amazing connections to for Bio, uh, the Norwegian school for uh, biosystematics, we also got a host. So thanks to them, we can have. Uh, uh, this amazing cluster at our disposition is Kenta around if he would if he if he would like to say some words from for bio si uh, side it would be a perfect moment to step up yeah thanks yeah i'm around but yeah i don't have anything to say on behalf of for bio so that's your workshop camille <laughs> and jose all right Kenta. but thank you very much for having us um and thank you for like they, they did handle for us all those like registration forms and uh, it, it was very easy to work with them too so again thank you very much um so about the participation we kind of knew that people need to or like want to learn about gamers but uh, we got nearly 100 applications and in the end we have 61 participants that are spending 10 different time zones which I would say it's pretty remarkable. I think the uh, what some of the lecture. So I think the westernmost would be Christina Hudson from uh, BC, and the easternmost would be I think we had an application from Japan. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. <laughs> so what what time is it right now in Japan? Um, it's just eleven past uh, eleven o'clock. Yeah. So seven hours ahead of you. Thank, thank you a lot for registering. That, that is a real dedication. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for um, accommodating my talk um, in the first few slots. <laughs> sure thing. Um, so the, the whole point of like the vision we came up with the workshop with was to create some sort of introduction to the world of gamers, which is sort of a concept that is used in a variety of topics in bioinformatics. And I think one of the problems why it's so hard to grasp it is because it's used on like a lot of distinct places for different purposes. So it's very hard as a concept, but it is, the thing is, it is a concept and it's teachable. And that's why we wanted to attempt to do so. And then when we were discussing it further, we actually realized that this is the, exactly the type of workshop we would like to attend a few years back when we started with the genomics. So this is this is a philosophy we really took when we were writing all the materials. So um, I hope you would agree that it, or like you will like it as well. Um, so we've decided to cut the program in several blocks. Uh, different people will uh, teach you at are responsible for different blocks and uh, basically it's spanned over four days you actually all know all that um, we have also three invited talks that will be associated with individual blocks from Christina uh, uh, Hannes and Paolo uh, but uh, this is a workshop and I think the important bit is oh yeah Oh, so the organization will be done mostly through the Slack. So uh, please be, make sure that it works. So we have a, uh, like a channel for big announcements in general. Uh, it's, if you would like to search for somebody who has similar interests, uh, nearly everybody posted some sort of bio in Introduce Yourself. So uh, find uh, your friends. And then we have these session specific channels. But most importantly, we also have the channels for social interactions. So if you would like to engage in casual conversations or science chatter, uh, feel free. And I would heavily like to encourage you to do so. The materials we uh, develop are, will be hosted on GitHub or they are already mostly there. Some of them needs to be a bit uh, finished up, but uh, they, they are on this URL. 
it, it's on linked to my GitHub account in oh no repository and it's on the wiki. So the the repository is quite bare. So just keep in mind that you always have to click on the wiki. And this also links links to wiki. So the, the wiki will show you everything. So the important bit of the workshop is also to connect with each other because you will have a lot of data problems that probably somebody else have as well. So don't hesitate to talk to others. So I'm not saying that you should not take any breaks, but there, I hope that there will be enough gaps uh, around for you to interact and uh, with each other. And I would encourage, again, encourage to do so. We also created you a spatial chat room. And as you can see, you can be like very happily chatting in there. Uh, it's it's accommodating all, up to 50 people because we were uh, not buying the, the, the paid version. So it's like a free trial. So you can always like drag your face around, which is quite nice because it's kind of simulating the, the real life uh, interactions. So again, please use it, communicate, network. Um, so now I would we will introduce a tiny bit the lectures. Uh, you will notice that the backgrounds uh, on, <laughs> will be corresponding to the blogs they are teaching. So you already know Rishi, those that you've been to um, the Bash Refresher. So I would then uh, ask Rishi if he could introduce himself a tiny bit. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, those of you who have been to Bash Refresher have met me. Um, maybe it would help if I give a bit of background about me. So I've worked on many different genomics type topics now. I've worked on many different systems. Um, I started working on things like DNA barcoding. Um, I've worked on uh, yeah, microbial community dynamics uh, and trying to address questions in speciation. My main interests I would say are about adaptation and speciation. And if you've heard me talk, you've probably heard me talk about alpine whitefish, which is what I did in my PhD on. And there I predominantly handled whole genome data and did some de novo genome assembly and linkage mapping for the alpine whitefish system, which is this very cool adaptive radiation of whitefish in Switzerland, predominantly. Um, trying to understand basically how this parallel diversification uh, of whitefish has occurred. Um, I also interested in questions about things like um, the genome architecture of adaptive traits and speciation. And now I actually work on um, Danaeus butterflies, so the African monarch butterfly. And my main interest in this project is uh, looking at supergene evolution. So these butterflies have this amazing variation in wing pattern linked to a supergene. And my current postdoc project is about working out how those different supergene alleles arose and how they're maintained um, and what we can understand about the evolution of sort of adaptive phenotypes and uh, speciation migration based on this system. So um, yeah, if you have any general questions about bioinformatics, I've worked on many different types of data. Um, and so, yeah, feel free to use the Slack channel and uh, get in touch or anything like that. Thanks. You muted, Camel. <laughs> the first of the conference <laughs> or the workshop. <laughs> Sorry, it's just like when you are on full screen, it's really hard to find the bar that actually controls it because it can be literally anywhere. <laughs> Sorry, so the, the, the second teacher here will be Lucia. Yes, Lucia, can, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. I think that's the second check in the in, in, <laughs> in the bingo. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, I basically uh, have worked with plants since I started uh, the biology pathway. Um, so I, I did my master's in Wageningen in the Netherlands, and um, there I focused mostly on Arabidopsis, and I did a bunch of GWAS analysis. Um, but then I realized that model species were a bit boring, and I moved to a, a botanical garden here in Edinburgh. Um, and then I realized that the massive variety and, and really cool um, variation of, of species and genomes that I was missing when I was working with Rabidopsis. And I did my PhD in begonias, which is a massive uh, plant genus. And I focused on uh, genome diversity and evolution, mostly looking at repeat uh, variation in the genomes. Uh, it was a massive challenge because uh, we basically had uh, no genomic uh, um, background or, or 
uh, models in the genomes. When I started my PhD, we had like a really, really drafty genome uh, that I had to improve before starting anything else. And then I sequenced um, eight species more, uh, which I started from scratch and from with very few data. So like KMER spectra and uh, looking into KMERs of all the species really, really helped me to understand the biology of them a lot more. Because uh, I didn't know I was dealing with garden hybrids with, you know, ancient polyploids uh, and a lot of other weird stuff that, of course, nobody knew about. So, yeah, um, that was my PhD. <laughs> uh, and now I finished the last year and I joined the Darwin Tree of Life team. Uh, as, uh, from, and I'm continuing working with plants, uh, with plant team here in Edinburgh. Um, so I do part of the um, analysis of the barcodes here, uh, which the RBG uh, does most of the plants of. And then I also work on the organelle assembly of all the plants. And uh, I am dealing with the trickiest plant genomes as well. So we're planning the sequencing of the largest vascular plant genome. Uh, well, the largest genome actually, that uh, the detailed plan is to sequence planning to sequence, which is the mistletoe one. And, and I'm dealing with a, a few other species that are uh, kind of iconic in Scotland, like the mistletoe, oh, sorry, like the Scottish thistle. Um, so yeah, that's that's me at the moment. And yeah, get in touch if you'd like to chat about plants anytime. <laughs> All right, I think I'm the next one. Um, my name is Kamil. I've done my PhD in Switzerland with Tanya Schwander, focusing on uh, uh, species that are reproducing asexually. And uh, asexual species quite often have quite freaky genomes. And uh, I also realized that I don't want to work just on like a single species. So I started to like explore what kind of asexual genomes are there. And I tell you, lots of them are just very, very messy. So I came by a similar trajectory as Luthia, that I started with genomes that were messy and I found myself a need to use KMERS to, to actually understand them. And now in my postdoc, I'm, I'm focusing on a species that are reproducing with paternal genome elimination, which are like different uh, non-model organisms that are also super messed up for completely different reasons. But in the end, basically I always end up working with KMER or developing KMER methods, not because I would like be per se uh, trying to be bioinformatician, but because I'm just simply trying to have at least some ways how to understand my own genomic data. So I hope I will manage to uh, uh, transmit this need to look at the data and, and to ability to, to just, um, just look and see. Um, yes, I think that's it. Yeah, I, I did smudge plot, by the way. <laughs> If you heard about that one, I think that's fun. Is Jose? Hi everyone. My name is Jose. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences and Technology, and um, I did my PhD also here in Norway in Oslo, working with cryptic speciation and topics similar to, to those Rishi was mentioning, um, population genetics, phylogenetics, and such. But then I moved to work a bit on the realm of comparative genomics and I got this project that you guys will be hearing about, um, which is about trees in the Galapagos. And um, the first thing I did was to get the genome and get a half, and I had to separate the, the ploidy. So yeah, um, I use, I use KMERS to, to separate subgenomes. That's basically what I do. And now in my research, I'm just focusing on adaptive radiations and other type of um, fancy things that happen in islands. So I'm working with Cape Verde sparrows, I'm working with Hawaiian spiders and with um, Galapagos trees, and always in the realm of diversification, adaptive radiation, speciation genomics, um, using object phylogenetics and comparative genomics, as I said. And I think the last teacher who is for sure not here because it would be too uh, well. Actually, it won't, it won't be too early. Is Savage here by any chance? No, I don't think so. Uh, 
So it was us four that organized the core of the, the workshop, but we have, and we are all four that sort of like uh, volunteered early on. And then we have one invited teacher who's Siavash uh, Miradab, who's quite famous actually what he, in what he does, unlike <laughs> all others. <laughs> and uh, he, he's going to uh, show us a lot of tools that he developed in his lab on analyzing genome skimming data. So uh, we're actually quite excited to hear what he's going to say too. Like we're definitely going to learn a lot from Siavash. So um, yeah, that's not really introducing him. Well, it's, it's very hard. Right? <laughs> well, you can read his webpage. He has like very nice uh, description of what he's interested in. Um, so besides having the teachers, we also have this uh, application lectures. So we tried to give you a bit more broad, um, like it's just, we, we will be teaching you a certain types of analysis or certain approaches and not necessarily of like what they are good for or the, the alternatives. So that's why we have these guest lecture talks, which will give you some sort of an idea about how the camera approaches can be applied. So Christina will tell you about like how we separated GRC chromosomes in the fungus nuts, German restricted chromosomes in fungus nuts, and like what exact technology we could have learned from it. And as it will give you an, uh, an, uh, an alternative approach for how to fit a certain uh, parameters to camera spectra, especially we we're focusing on the, the tetrapods, which is actually really handy too. And Paul's going to give uh, a talk uh, by the end of the Siavash uh, blog, which is again, not really my domain. So I'm actually really looking forward to hear and understand of how they are using gamers to uh, understand metagenomics or bait capture data. And with this, I would like to stop uh, gibbering and, uh, <laughs> and let the workshop begin. Uh, feel free to tweet about everything. We have a hashtag. And uh, if you will do so, we will like you. Um, and with this, I will give uh, the word to Rishi so he can moderate the, the flash talk session. Perfect. OK, so we have um, yeah 10 flash talks for you. Um, I gave, I think, slightly scary uh, suggestions of what people should include, which maybe put some people off giving talks. But 10 people have stepped up. Um, what I said originally was that there would be five minutes for talks and two minutes for questions. I think we can extend the questions a little bit longer if we have them, but um, I'll keep everybody to time. And at the very end, we can always go back if people have sort of leftover questions for everybody. So first we have, uh, yeah, I think as we already said, our furthest East, I guess, speaker, Garov from uh, Japan, who's gonna talk to us about, uh, about his work. So Garov, take it away. I think you should be able to share screen, but if you can't, just let us know. All right, um, thank you. Let me. Um, does that work? Yep, we see your screen. Yes. Okay. All right, so first of all, thank you to all the organizers for putting together this um, workshop. I look forward to learning a lot about KMERS. Um, so yeah, my name is Gaurav and I'm joining from Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology um, in Okinawa, which is a beautiful subtropical island um, in southern Japan. So I'm going to jump, jump straight in and just tell you a little bit about what I'm trying to do for my PhD dissertation. Um, so I'm studying a group of ants, um, a genus called Stomigenes, which is a highly diverse genus. There's about a thousand species distributed all over the world. And our hundreds of these species have evolved something called trap jaw mandibles. So these ants are specialized predators of uh, tiny soil arthropods called springtails. And the springtails have um, basically a spring on their butt that, that they use to escape predation. And to counteract this um, escape mechanism, these ants have evolved uh, trap jaw mandibles. So the ants are pretty small, two to three millimeters only, uh, but their mandibles pack a bunch. Uh, they are no, they're capable of producing the fastest um, acceleration of any animal movement we know so far. 
Um, and with the evolution of trap jaw, you also see uh, the evolution of a bunch of other traits, like with the trap jaw, the ants tend to be active hunters, whereas uh, the non trap jaw species are passive hunters that uh, wait for the prey or even sometimes chemically lure the prey to come to them. Um, the trap jaw species also have wider diet breadth. Um, they also have evolved something called giant neurons, which are uh, presumably necessary to operate the ultra fast mandibles. So our lab has been studying uh, the evolution of this group for a while. And they did a study um, recently in which they reconstructed the phylogeny of uh, 450 species that includes more than 90% of the taxonomic groups. So we have a pretty good understanding of the evolutionary relationships uh, among these species at the global scale. So what they found was that- Garav, Garav, sorry to interrupt. I think we're still seeing your cover slide. So I don't know if we're supposed to see some other slides, but it's maybe worth just sharing again so we can see any figures, unless you're still on the first slide. <laughs> Wait, so- We just see your cover slide so far. Just the title slide, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh -oh, yes. No. That that is not. But your presentation was so far extremely clear. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but wait, let me restart sharing. Why is that happening right now? Okay, can you see it now? Yes, the Is other it, slides. It's just yeah. Slide or something else. In the next slide. Uh, we see the second slide that you're on. Okay. Okay. So now I'm entering full screen. Is it still? Yep. Now we see the second okay. slide. Okay. Yep. All right. So yeah, that's a bummer. Uh, but anyway, this is what I was talking about. Um, so here's the. Here's a, here's a micro CD image of uh, the head from the front. So these are the gripping mandibles and these are the trap jaws. And here I was say, showing how uh, the ants tend to be passive hunters versus um, active hunters. Here's a lab uh, colony. Um, and yeah, the, the global distribution. Um, so anyway, uh, the what this study found was that um, the trap jaw mandibles, the trap jaw phenotype that includes not only the mandibles, but some other traits as well, has evolved independently in different regions of the world. So here, the gray is uh, the uh, ancestral gripping mandibles and the uh, red and orange um, are trap jaw mandibles. So there's some uncertainty, but it's the evolution is between seven and 10 times independently in different regions, regions of the world. So I found it pretty fascinating when I was beginning my PhD and saw this research. So I thought it might be interesting to use this system and ask some interesting questions like, you know, uh, how uh, how re repeated are, uh, are changes at the genomic level that drive this phenotypic convergence? Uh, and what are the relative contributions of uh, protein coding versus regulatory regions uh, to this convergence? And then I'm also interested in doing some Evo Devo work uh, using Okinawan ants um, so that uh, should, in theory, complement what I'm doing at the uh, at the genome level. So the idea is that uh, Karov, Karov, sorry, maybe I think presenter view is not um, is not showing us the next slides. But if you want to just exit the presenter view, you can show us all your nice figures. There we go. Yeah. Now we can see them. Maybe if you just zoom in a bit, it's actually it's actually fine. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and no problem. Yeah. No, no, no. It's totally okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, here um, is the uh, phylogenetic deconstruction. You see ancestral phenotype is the uh, gripping mandibles and the trap jaw mandibles have evolved independently. Uh, and there's a, a biogeographic signal. So different regions of the world have uh, evolved this, uh, this diversity at the community level. Um, so th these are ki the kinds of questions I'm interested um, in. And the idea is that uh, I sequence a bunch of stomachinous genomes representing independent transitions to a uh, trap jaw phenotype and analyze uh, this sequence evolution in a comparative framework. So last year or so, 
I spent uh, some time getting the genomics pipeline, uh, the assembly pipeline standardized. So I'm working on annotation now, but, uh, and there's no time to get into details, but just to give you a quick uh, glimpse, we started with pretty high uh, quality DNA, and then we use packed bio CCS, um, AKA HiFi, which is long and accurate treats uh, for contig assembly. And then we use Dovetail OmniC for scaffolding. And um, I just want, we've done like about eight genomes so far. Uh, and these species are from uh, mainly from Asia and Africa. And I wasn't quite sure how to um, present these results. So I've just done some basic plots on um, for these uh, uh, the assembly stats. So here to give you an idea, uh, the genomes are pretty small. So we get pretty decent coverage from just a single uh, SQL2 cell. Uh, and our contig N50s uh, tend to be around seven MB. And of course, scaffold is a bit uh, bigger. And QV uh, for the final, some of the final assemblies that I, I talked about, uh, we calculated with mercury. Uh, I've plotted against uh, the Busco score. So the QV, thanks to high fire rates, tend to, pretty tend to be pretty high. And Busco scores are also uh, almost always more than 98, which is um, pretty decent, I think. Um, yeah, here's some example, um, you know, final high symmetrices. Uh, and yeah, this is still work in progress. You know, we have to do some manual curation. We're trying all sorts of assemblers and scaffolders and so on. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And I just want to thank some people, just Gene Myers, uh, some of you might know, uh, OIST uh, hired him as an adjunct and we were quite lucky to have him come to OIST uh, right when we were starting our project. So he's really a key collaborator. Uh, so he's, he, yeah, and we work with Yoshi who's postdoc with, of Gene's. Um, yeah, and some other people um, that are really great to work with. And with that, thank you again. And um, sorry for the glitch, but yeah, again, thank you to the organizers. Great talk, thank you very much. Even with the uh, with the technical difficulties, it was presented so nicely. I think we were all following along anyway. So um, we have a few questions in the chat. Maybe I can, I guess people have posted them in here, so I'll read them out to you, unless people really want to ask them. So Sabrina asked, uh, how varied will the genomes be in uh, species and geographic range to answer the convergence question? So I guess you already presented the uh, genome size variation. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, one of the concerns um, I had begin in the beginning was, you know, we're trying, so the, the this genus is a uh, group is 35 million years uh, old, roughly. So with, time you're accumulating a lot of um, random um, changes in the genome. So initially we were trying to sequence like a lot more, but because of COVID uh, obtaining material is really hard. Uh, so we even thought of doing some, you know, not so good genomes, but anyway, uh, there are some other studies to, uh, that have done, taken similar approach and they have been able to, uh, you know, detect some signatures. So yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see how, like, basically, if we have enough statistical power to detect to relate the genomic and phenotypic changes. Excellent. So we have another question from Cobus, who says, uh, "Do the ants from the diverse regions have similar prey? So is it, for example, independent evolution, but like a conserved food source that they're all adapted to?" Um, yeah, they have the same uh, prey, uh, and that's really why they have evolved the, again and again, uh, you would think the, the really fast mandibles, because the prey have a really fast escape mechanism. So to really, you know, catch the super fast prey, these ants have to have like really, really fast uh, mandibles. And we have one more from the chat, and then I think we can go to the, the people who have questions who want to ask them themselves. This is from Ronald. This is actually a great question. I was also thinking the same thing. So for such small organisms, do you grind down the whole specimen for your extractions? And if so, how do you deal with microbial contaminants in your sequence data? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, initially, like Gene is really keen on, you know, doing just single individual because obviously it's the best way. But uh, what we, so what we did initially was we, um, we did three, we, so we use pupae because pupae 
uh, yield much more DNA compared to adults. And what we initially did was we did three pupae and barcoded each of them. And then uh, from one of them, we got decent um, like 20X back bio hi-fi coverage, which is kind of enough to get a decent uh, quantic assembly. And then we tried and combined all the data to see what happens. And the, the, what we found was that these genomes have really low heterozygosity. So it's a good idea to have um, you know, low heterozygosity, but you need at least some heterozygosity to tell apart uh, the haplotypes. Um, so we have a, the problem we have is like too much homozygosity. So, so from then on, what we decided was uh, that it doesn't really hurt to have two, um, you know, two, two ants together because these, these are not clonal, uh, like exactly identical, but they all come from the same colony. And as you might know, ants are eusocial. So they're much more related to each other than like uh, humans, for example. So yeah, um, contaminants, we be, because we use pupae, um, we first put them in alcohol. So we just, you know, get rid of the surface contaminants. Um, the, at the last larval instar, uh, the, what the larva does, it basically, ejects all the food it's eaten so far. And so it's like a virgin, uh, sterile in a gut environment. So we don't really get any contaminants. And, uh, and then we, we also, the high fire rates, we can, um, you know, um, we can bioinformatically also check for contaminants. So, but so far that's, that hasn't really been uh, an issue. Excellent. Are there any questions uh, from the room? Otherwise we can, uh, thank Gaurav and I move on, but raise your hand or, or just speak up if you have another question. Okay, in that case, we will move on. Thanks very much, Gaurav, and thanks so much for making the time despite it being so late in uh, Japan. No, thank you. So, so next we have a talk from Surabi. If Surabi is here, feel free to uh, share your screen. Hello, just a second. Excellent. Is that okay? Yep, we see your slides. Uh, can you see the slides moving? Yeah, we can see, okay, we can okay. see the Perfect, take it away. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I recently finished my PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Sorry, my name is Suruvi. Uh, and I recently finished my PhD uh, at the University of Edinburgh and Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. And I will be talking about a chapter from my PhD, which is uh, investigating the genetic basis of flexi styli. So flexi styli is a unique floral dimorphism found in a genus called Alpinia and other closely related genera in the ginger family of plants. So basically within a population, there are two floral morphs. One is the cataflexi stylus morph, which is male first. So when the flower first opens, the stylus curved above the anther and the anther releases pollen. And in the second morph type, which is the anaflexi stylus morph, which is female first, the style is curved below the anther and the anthers do not release pollen in the morning. Now, the interesting thing is around midday, they switch function. So the style that was curved upwards curves downwards and the pollen release is halted in this case. And in the second morph type, the style curves upwards and um, the anthers start to release pollen. Now, this mechanism has uh, basically evolved to um, prevent interference between the uh, pollen and um, the pistil and to promote outcrossing in species. And because these uh, morph types are, like each morph type is born on an individual and they are found in a one is to one ratio within a population, it is presumed that a single locus governs this trait. So my question was to understand the genetic basis of this trait. So in order to do that, my first aim was to generate a reference genome for Alpinia nigra, which is the study species that I selected. And uh, the next step was to find the regions with allele frequency differences between the two morph types using a pool seek approach. So my hypothesis here was that um, flexi styli, as it is a complex phenotypic trait, it is uh, possibly controlled by multiple but tightly linked loci. So we would expect to see a cluster of high SST values upon comparing the allele frequency differences between the two pools. 
So just a little bit about the study system. So this is Alpinia nigra, uh, which is widespread across uh, continental Asia. And uh, these are the two morph types. So the cataflexis stylus or the male first morph and the anaflexis stylus or the female first morph. And I collected these individuals from Arunachal Pradesh in India. Um, so the next step was to generate a reference genome assembly. So um, I had to stick to short Illumina reads because I had problems with DNA extraction. So um, I had uh, 250 base bed, uh, reads with 100x coverage from a cataflexy stylus individual, which I randomly selected. And then I carried out a genome assembly using Discover De Novo and came analysis using CAT uh, with the help of Hannes, who's going to uh, have a session later uh, in this course. And then as for the pool seek approach, uh, I sequenced two pools of 51 individuals of anaflexy stylus and 63 cataflexy stylus individuals. So uh, two different pools with a high number of individuals from the same population as the individual that I used for the genome. And um, so I used a 150 base by parent illuminaries at 50X coverage. Then I aligned the two separate pools with the reference genome uh, assembled here and then um, calculated FST values using a sliding window approach with window sizes 1 kbp and 10 kbp using population 2 software. Um, so in terms of the genome assembly, uh, we see that this is um, a heterozygous genome and the heterozygosity is about 1.06%, uh, which is uh, expected for an outcrossing species. Uh, now this plot here is, um, plot which compares the, the KMERS that are present in the raw reads as compared to the KMERS represented in the assembly. And the different colors represent the number of times the KMERS are represented. So the red is where the KMERS are represented once, purple is represented twice, and so on. And there are some number of duplicates as well. Um, and the estimated genome size from the KMERS spectra is about two over 2 GB, uh, gigabase pairs. Um, the issue with this assembly is that it's highly fragmented because it's using short reads. So the number of contexts is quite high, but as soon as you filter out uh, below 1,000 base pairs, it's very low. But then again, it's a decent assembly in terms of the PASCO score um, and the N50. So um, the next step was uh, the pool seek and comparison of the two pools. So um, using population two, this is like the genome-wide FST scan across the whole genome. And uh, we were expecting to see a cluster of high FST values in a certain region. Um, can't really see here from the whole genome. This is for the whole genome. So I decided to zoom in on 500 um, megabase pair regions. So these are the first two from this window size. And we couldn't really find anything here. So, um, this was inconclusive. The same was the result for the other uh, windows, uh, other um, mega, um, like other regions of the genome, and even with the one kilobase pair region. So what we found was that uh, the genome-wide uh, sliding window FST scans did not reveal any significant allele frequency differences. So we were expecting either this region. So this is a complex trait. So it's possibly governed by a chromosomal inversion or something like that. But because chromosomal inversions are often surrounded by transposable elements and they're often difficult to assemble with a short period assembly, um, this was um, difficult to detect in with the data that I had. Um, and Hannes uh, also compared the to KMR, uh, the KMRs of the ANA pool and the CATA pool, and we didn't really find anything conclusive there. So my question is, uh, can KMRs be used to identify structural variants between the two morph types? Um, and I would like to thank my supervisors, Alex, Mark, and Vinita, and Hannes, of course, for helping out with the analyses and the forest department and the field work funding. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, first uh, came a distribution plot of the of the workshop. I think the. <laughs> Thanks, Hannes. <laughs> any questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, the switch at midday well, for the stylist uh, is that uh, light and temperature dependent? Can that give you some insights on possibly where to look in your genome? 
for the type of switch if this is the locus you're, you're targeting? Um, it's not temperature dependent because um, there have been studies before that said that uh, if, uh, if the temperature is lower in the day, then the movement is slower or faster. So it's only the speed of the movement that's affected. But this trail is re uh, trait is regulated by light. So for one of the morph types, light is important for activation, but for the other morph type, it isn't. So there's something there. So we need to look for um, genes that possibly control light and oxygen transport and things like that. Great, any other questions from anybody? No, nope. okay, well then we'll move on. Thank you very much, Sarabi. And next we have Gustavo is going to present to us about trees. The first of a few, I think, uh, planty, or well, the second rather, planty talk. Hi, it's Gustavo. Hello. There we go. Yeah, feel free to share your screen. Sure. Excellent, we can see that. Right. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Is it, should it be full screen already? Yeah, I guess I will be able to pass on the slides if I made it, make it full screen. I'll just try again. And do you see it full screen now? Um, no, I just see the slides. I think the recipe for success is to first put it on full screen and then share it rather than the other way around. All oh, right. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Sorry about it. It's okay. Um, how does it look like now? Uh, we have your view, so I think you want to swap views if you can do that. Um, we have like the presenter view. Mm -hmm. I think if you go to display settings on that drop down menu, you should be able to swap the view. Yeah, there you go. All right. And <clears throat> wait a minute, we still see the <laughs> we still see the presenter view. <laughs> oh no. Um, anything changed there? No, I don't know if you just want to go back onto the like PowerPoint view and then just make it, just zoom it in and make the, the bars, taskbar really small or something. Yeah, I guess that. That might be an option too, if you don't have any animations or anything. Always do, always have some animations, but no worries. It's gonna... <laughs> right. Um, well, I guess I'll present like if it's okay. Sure, just take it away. Yeah, we can. We can always, if yeah. people want to share their presentations later, we can always kind of facilitate that somehow. So, don't worry. Yeah, I just don't want to take any more of, of the time. Really, that's okay. Well, you still <laughs> able to see the slides, right? Yep, yep. We can see the slides. Go for it. All right. Cool. cool. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, um, being here and watching the presentations. And it's really nice to learn about cameras now because um, I'm using this approach to estimate the genome size of my of the species that I'm working on and learn about their heterozygosity and also a few other things that might be helpful for me to do the assembly of these genomes. And um, so the my thesis is entitled the Endureclade Case Studies in the Evolution of Legume Flower and Taxonomy of Amazon Trees. And my supervisors are Professor Toby Pennington and Dr. Catherine Kidner. And as well as Surabi, I'm based in Edinburgh and um, from the University of Edinburgh and also the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh. And um, well, I usually divide my, my presentations and my thesis in two parts, which is the taxonomic part of it and also the uh, genomic part of it. And just to uh, show a bit what a legume flower looks like. I've got a slide here with a few pictures of it, with a few representatives. Among them, the chickpeas, mandels, uh, 
cheese as well and soybean. So this is a very uh, highly specialized structure in, in the Fabaceae family, which is the pea family. And you can see like the petals are quite differentiated into a bana petal in the uh, upper side and two lateral wings and two keel petals, which are partially fused. And uh, it's so specialized that it's probably the, the main reason why the group is so diverse. It comes with about 21,000 uh, species in the family. So it's quite a big number of uh, species. And it's, uh, it's, a it's a kind of morphology that's quite predominant in the whole family, especially in the subfamily Faboidae. And but it's not the only, um, the only kind of morphology that we can see in the family. As, is it, as it's presented, for example, in the genus Aldina, which is a Amazonian genus. So it's uh, restricted to the Amazon basin, only found in the countries um, where the Amazon forest is uh, found, such as Colombia, Venezuela, Guyana, Brazil, and probably with some distribution in Peru as well. And so the, the taxonomic bit of my project is revising all the names that have been published so far in the genus. So in yellow, you see a few species that I have done the taxonomic treatment during my master's studies, for example. So those are all species with distribution in Brazil. And all the other species in white are distributed in other countries, especially in Venezuela. And as you can see, this flower, the flowers of Aldina is fairly different from what a pea flower looks like, right? So the petals are not differentiated. We have, they also have numerous stamens and um, the morphology and the symmetry itself, it's uh, radially symmetric, differently from the pea family, which is zygomorphic. And um, these features of Aldina are quite interesting because uh, when we take into account uh, the phylogenetic position of the genus, we see that it's, it's a sister group of two papillonated gen genera, the genera Hymenolobium and Andira. And in these phylogenetic studies, it, show, it shows that they have a strong relationship that's uh, supported with high, um, high support. And um, again, the flower morphology of these genera are quite different, although we might see some similarity in fruit uh, morphology, as you see in figure images C and I, which are from Antira and Albina, respectively. And they all are, have a preference for humid forests. But apart from that, flowers are really different. And interestingly, this is not the only case in the subfamily where you find a clade which is comprised by uh, species with papillonate flowers and a sister group that has radially symmetric flower. If we look into the phylogeny of the papillonoid subfamily, we will see that uh, there are many groups, many clades, small clades, where this uh, very same scenario is reproduced. And apparently only in the most derived clade, which is represented here by the NPAAA um, clade, this uh, papillonate um, morphology seems to have been established and you don't see any other kind of morphology in there. So it's quite interesting to look into the phylogenies, try to figure out what's this pattern. So what kind of evolutionary processes underlying the presence of these radially symmetric of flowers in the, in the subfamily, since the papillonate flower is quite, uh, uh, has a really high adaptive uh, value for, for, this, for this group. And then uh, one of the main questions of my project is to identify which genes are related to the development of this kind of symmetry in these flowers, in these groups. And a series of candidate genes have been reported in the literature in different groups. And you might be more familiar with the antirhino, for example, the snapdragon. And we have here a list of four uh, genes which 
play a role in the determination of, of floral identity and shows how they have this very intrinsic interplay between them. So there should be a animation here, but it's mostly showing that uh, with the presence of cycloidia genes in the dorsal uh, domain of the flower, if you check on the skin there, uh, we there will be um, a transcription of uh, the rad protein, which will bind to drift, and then therefore it will keep it from binding to div, and that will keep the dorsal identity of the of the flower. And in the ventral domain, by the absence of cycloidia, uh, rad won't be transcribed, so that the drift and div complex will be promoted. And then it will keep the ventral uh, identity, which is which should be which should uh, show the phenotype, um, the phenotype, the wild phenotype of the snapdragon, which is this one here, which is agomorphic. And um, however, if we don't have the cycloidia genes in the dorsal domain controlling the the identity of that domain we would then find a, a ventralization of the whole flower. And then this radial uh, phenotype would appear in the, uh, in the flowers. So it's very sensitive to the presence of cycloidia. And that made me think that these genes might be playing a role in these legumes as well, since they have also this um, radially symmetric um, phenotype. And there has been a few studies with um, with uh, another species of legumes that show the cycloidia genes that are also involved in the determination of uh, flower symmetry, and it might be the same case going on with the all the lineages that I just saw in the in that phylogeny. So my work is aiming to target those species with radially symmetric morphology and compare them with their uh, zygomorphic relatives and uh, see the, um, for example, if those candidate genes are present in their genomes and also do RNA-seq experiments in order to compare the level of expression of these genes between species. And <clears throat> well, so far I have, I have, um, have done the whole genome sequencing of four species that has, have been cultivated in the um, botanic gardens. And I have started to do a few preliminary analysis with the chemers. And the next step should be do the assembly of the genomes and, and then blast my candidate gene sequences against this genome and see if they are present there. And finally uh, run the RNA seq uh, experiments as well, and then extract the RNA, and it's just a line of the experiment with RNA seq, where you should use the de novo approach because all the genomes available so far are phylogenetically distant from what I from what I got from my samples, so that should be um, the way to go after identifying those candidate sequences in the genomes. All right, and it's, it, it'll just be over time, Gustavo. So if you could wrap it up, if you've got a conclusion slide or something, we can- uh, Yeah, sure, on. sure. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the end of it. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and I, I just have a few other slides, which are um, which were the first Kamer analysis that I did with Kamer Genie and just to check on the uh, genome size of these samples. And well, I'm hoping to learn more about this and have extract more and interpret better <laughs> my graphs. So, Excellent. Yeah, that's it. I don't Thank think we have any time for questions, but if you have any questions for Gustavo, you can always message him on, uh, on Slack or anything like that. That'd be great. Thanks yeah. very much for your talk. Um, you. So next we have uh, Mary Lou, who's going to talk about mosquitoes, I think. So if they're here, please share your screen. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> well, I'll add to the standard questions. Can everyone see my screen? And we, oh, we can see your screen. Great. Thank that's you. That's something 
change if I do this? Yep, it's all moving. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. So yeah, I'm working on uh, mosquitoes, a genus of mosquitoes called Anopheles, and that is the genus of mosquitoes that can spread uh, human malaria. And um, it's reasonably big. There is, well, nothing compared to these 22,000 in plants <laughs> and genus, but there is uh, over 500 uh, described species. And about 60 of them can actually transmit malaria. Um, but they are not sort of nicely contained in a certain part of the tree. But this vector capacity is really found throughout the whole tree. Um, so mosquitoes that look exactly the same morphologically um, can be have huge different potential for spreading malaria or not. So therefore, it's very important to be able to tell apart these species. Um, and how that's commonly done is, well, First of all, morphologically, because especially uh, species in different subgenera will look reasonably different and an experienced um, taxonomist can actually tell them apart. But uh, Anopheles also has a lot of so-called species complexes of very closely related species that look exactly the same morphologically. Um, and here is an example of this. On the left, you have Anopheles gambi, which is probably the most important malaria vector. On the right is Anopheles quadrionalatus, which is a closely related species, but it only bites cows and it has never been found with a malaria parasite. So two that look exactly the same, but it's very important for any kind of intervention uh, or malaria control measure, measure to be able to tell them apart. So then the next step, once you've said, okay, I think these are all in this complex of closely related species, then the next step that you commonly take is use a PCR-based species di diagnostic where you read of the bands and then um, based on that can tell what species it is. But there's also some problems with this because, well, first of all, these anopheles inside these complexes are all so closely related that they can actually interbreed with each other. And then a single marker is not super informative if you want to know which species it is. And secondly, uh, if your species, if you think it's in the complex and you use the PCR for that complex, but it, the sample that you're testing is not actually in this complex, it will fill, but a fill will tell you nothing on whether you have wrongly identified the complex or um, whether it was bad DNA. And it's extremely common that uh, even species that are not in the same complex are confused. Um, right, so to alleviate that, um, the group of my supervisor has developed a targeted amplicon sequencing panel. Um, and that is actually very cool because it works throughout the whole genus. I won't go in too much into the details, but it targets some loci in the DNA um, that have highly variable targets between species, but, um, but that they're flanked by very conserved sites, which then act as primer binding sites. So um, you can use the same primer for all these different species in the genus, and then you will get end up with uh, a small amount of sequence. So there are 60 targets, and they're each about 150 to 200 base pair long. So it's in total only 12 kb. Um, but it should be the kind of informative sequence to distinguish the species. And on top of that, it also targets the presence of plasmodium or malaria. So that is good that you can also see whether the mosquitoes you're studying are infected or not. Right. And I come in at um, a method to determine the species from the sequences. And for that, I actually use a KMER count table. So I think I use KMERs a bit different than most people have presented here because well, my data are very different, of course. Um, so, but I use camera counts because, first of all, it's independent from multiple from multiple sequence alignments, which is very important when I'm dealing with this huge diversity of species. Because in some places, the targets don't look anything like each other, and then uh, alignments just are very messy, and there's not one clear, correct alignment. Um, and secondly, it uses both uh, SNPs and indole information because with this small amount of sequence, sort of any information you can use is, uh, is an advantage. So my first uh, method is a nearest neighbor method. And basically what it does is for each test mosquito, 
I translate its sequence to an eight-month count table and then compare it to a reference database um, of mosquitoes for which I know the species by other means, so a labeled reference database. So here you can see a plot of this. So there's the reference samples here on the y-axis and then the targets on the x-axis. And I compute the k-mer distance um, for each of these targets to each of these reference samples. And then here they're colored. The light colored ones are ones that are very similar and the dark colored ones are ones that are not similar at all. And then if you use the labels from the reference data set, you can sort of assign um, a species to each of these test mosquitoes. So here on the x-axis there is test mosquitoes and then on the y-axis is how often it's uh, its nearest neighbor in the reference set is of a certain species. And I um, use some threshold to say uh, at least it has to be 80% matching to a nearest neighbor. And for many species that works very well. But you can see that for some species here, like it sort of matches most to one species, but it's not 100% convincing. And that makes sense because this is one of these species complexes of closely related species. So this method works for many species, but not within the species complexes. So for that, I have used another method, again, <laughs> using cameras. And this is a variational autoencoder. You can think of it a bit as just a dimension reduction method. But basically what it does, it takes very high dimensional input. And because I work on ATMERS, there is 65,000 unique ATMERS. So I use as input a table of ATMER counts send that uh, through a neural network, then it gets restricted down to a two-dimensional space, which is the encoded form of this high-dimensional data. And then from this two-dimensional space, it will send it through another neural network and come out with a simulated high-dimensional table. And then it learns the data structure by comparing the input to the output table. And from that, it's sort of learns how to represent the structure of the high dimensional data in a low dimensional latent space. And this latent space I then use to classify the species. So in this case, we're looking at three closely related species, uh, Anopheles gambi in blue, Anopheles kaluzzi in orange, and Anopheles arabiensis in green. And um, so this structure learning is completely unsupervised. It doesn't use the labels, but then once I have this latent space, I used the labels for my training set. And luckily I had a training set with hundreds of samples that were labeled from whole genome sequencing. And I just used um, my little loci of the, uh, of the sequence to, to sort of, uh, to use them as training samples. And um, yeah, then you get these nice clusters of species and then I just, cut up the space where each part of space of this latent space corresponds to one of the species. And then if I get a new sample, I send it, uh, translate it to ATMOS, I send it through uh, the encoder and it will land somewhere in the space. And if it lands, for instance, here, I say, ah, it lands in the orange part, it must be enough less kludzi. And this works very well for, um, for closely related species. So that's great. Um, and then, well, so <laughs> to also ask a question and say what maybe I hope to get out of this is um, this is a similar plot as I showed before. So it's a latent space of the variational autoencoder. But now instead of coloring the samples by species, I've colored them by their geography. So where they come from. And you can see that there is a bit of this cluster structure. We have the three species again. And here there's sort of this bar of this, this smear of samples and they're from the Gambi and um, Guinea-Bissau, so all the way in West Africa. And they are on their X chromosome, they seem like Anopheles Gambi, so that's also why they're labeled as such, but they're much closer to the other species than you would expect. And um, one thing I'm interested in is to uh, think about how you can have a method preferably with cameras for the reasons I uh, mentioned before where I use them, um, where you can say, is this an effect that's caused only by part of the genome or is it sort of, are they sort of throughout 
a bit mixed or they may be X generation hybrids between these two species or might it be that it's an inversion and there's just a few loci that have a very strong effect and that sort of caused its separation of groups. And um, yeah, that's it. If there's any questions. Thank, thanks for a beautiful talk and really nice, nice figures. Um, so there's one question in the chat, which I can ask. So it's from Oliver. He says, is there a public database for reference chemo accounts for different species? Or is this just something which uh, you have yourself and you need to generate yourself? So I've generated it myself also because um, some of these mosquitoes have published reference genomes, but maybe only for like 20 species or so. So there is many for which there's no reference genomes out there and we've just sequenced them with our panel and um, they're labeled either by a very experienced taxonomist or by barcodes. Yeah, very cool. And we have another question from Sabrina. So. Uh, Question is, uh, is the PCA made from uh, came accounts or SNPs here? I think it's uh, it's accounts, all came accounts. Right? Yeah. Excellent. Do we have any questions of people who want to ask that question themselves? If not, we can move on. I think uh, the best thing to do just for people's attention span is to do one more talk. So then we would be five out of 10. Uh, and then we could take like a 10 minute break and everybody can uh, yeah, have stretch their legs and then come back for the remaining five talks, if that works for everybody. We might overrun a little, but today we're supposed to finish a bit early anyway. So I think we'll move forward. We have uh, Laura, who's going to talk about uh, CARP and uh, the evolution of anoxia tolerance. So Laura, if you want to share your slides. Yes, can you see? Uh, I will yeah. not do full uh, speaker mode to avoid strange things. So to, I, I'm to avoid just what, starting. Sorry? I will not go full uh, presenter mode because maybe it causes problems. I don't know. I don't know. But, do you want to try it out? I think, it, I think you should try it out. It seems to be a person specific thing, like a, a random thing. Okay. Do you want to well, try if something happens, please stop me. <laughs> Can you try moving uh, um, to the second slide? Yeah, I guess I'll just stop, uh, jump to the second slide. Okay, and great. I'm works. just. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take it away. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll put my own time too. So okay. I'm just starting with my project, so I, I will mostly just explain the background. I don't have results yet, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, very exciting actually. So uh, my project is focused in studying the Croatian carp, which is the champion of anoxia tolerance. It's like the best of the best. It can survive up to six months on their frozen lakes. Well, not fro lake, not me completely frozen, but with a lid. So it's ice covered lakes. And in these lakes, oxygen cannot diffuse easily into the water. But it also is conscious during anoxia. Other species are like in a coma state. But now this one is awake <laughs> and is the champion of the champions. And uh, there's a related species, the goldfish. Uh, this one is like a domesticated uh, relate, related uh, species. And it also has an, an oxygen tolerance, but it's lower. And both are poly, poly, polyploids. So the Croatian carp has uh, interesting metabolic adaptations that we believe that they are lost or lowered in, in the goldfish. So then we want to compare them to see if we find something interesting. One of these adaptations uh, I want to, uh, that is very interesting is, so in general, in the lack, in anoxia, tissues like organ tissue, the brain produces lactate. And this lactate causes acidosis, which damages the cells and can cause, it can kill the animal. It's uh, really, really bad. But what crushing carp does is that it sends the lactate to the bloodstream then into the red uh, muscle cells. And these cells, they have this PDC, pyruvate decarboxylase, that uh, transforms the lactate into acetaldehyde. And this one, uh, with, they also have this more normal alcohol dehydrogenate <laughs> that produces ethanol. And this ethanol can uh, freely be released through the gills. So what the crucial carb is that does is that it has this huge uh, glucogen resource that uh, uh, reserves and it just releases it and that way it can survive it has other mechanisms but this is one and this one this pdc this one is a paralog 
of another common enzyme, the pyruvate dehydrogenase, that usually catalyzes the acetyl acetyl-CoA in orboxia. And this paralog come from duplicated genes uh, from its polyploid origin. So <laughs> to understand uh, how new functions could come, uh, we look into how the genome of the Crucian carp is, and also the, 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 the goldfish. And we find that they have four, uh, three <laughs> whole genome duplications that have happened throughout their evolution. So there's a large, there's an abundance of duplicated genes. And this is interesting because we observe an effect called subgenome dominance, which means that uh, since the genomes were duplicated, it has multiple copies and one is dominant. It takes over for all the functions of the, of the organism, takes care of the essential functions. But meanwhile, the other less active genomes, they, they have the opportunity to drift and change. And these new duplicates, even though they are duplicates, they start to acquire new functions or they start to be re repurposed. And that's how uh, the PCD for the anoxia tolerance uh, was obtained. And also it's interesting to mention that right after these duplications happen, the functionalization and evolution goes faster. And it, that's also related to speciation. So, <laughs> very quickly, uh, what I found that I thought that KMERS could be interesting for my project. So first, I'm, I'm working on the de novo assembly of the Crossing Carp genome. And then we want to compare with the goldfish and we're hoping to see like small differences, maybe maybe even within the, <laughs> the Crossing Carp, we might find uh, differences within the duplicated uh, genomes and chromosomes. Also for quality control, to see if my assembly is fine, <laughs> uh, bacterial contamination. And also I read that you can use it for looking for RNA isoforms, another way of variation. And yeah, oh, that's it. <laughs> well, that, that was it. And another thing I, I found about KMERS that I might be able to analyze my genome before I'm aligning it. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Can I ask one? Go for it. So I, I got stuck on like a very beginning of the presentation because I, I always thought that usually we uh, go opposite in opposite direction. That we when we ingest ethanol, we just al we use alcohol de dehydrogenase to reduce it to acetyl aldehyde, and then we like downstream like decompose it more and pee it out. So, are there many f species that actually go in the opposite direction and actually so because I'm, I, they must invest a lot of energy to create the ethanol out of the acetyl aldehyde, right? It, it must take energy. Yeah, it's like uh, they're throwing their money out of the window. It's like, why? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's... So uh, are, are, are there many species that do that? Because there would be like seven ATPs. Like, that's a lot. That's like one qu third of a sugar. Well, I, I'm still learning the topic, but I think the it may, I might be lying. May somebody in the crowd knows. Uh, I think there's also some turtles that do strange things. But they are, um, they kind of enter in a coma. <laughs> so that's that's a strange thing. Like, how come that this fish can remain awake and conscious and it's like swimming around? And uh, But yeah, that's uh, like the strange thing. And this PDC actually is made of subunits. And like the sequences are all the same. But in this case, they assembled it differently. <laughs> So it's like playing Lego, <laughs> like these duplicate, duplicated genes, I don't know, they assemble the difference, but if you see the sequences, it's the same. So it's interesting, yeah. Mm. Ah, cool stuff. Thank you. Any other questions? 
No, not for now. Okay, so what I would propose is that we take a, what should we say, 10 minute break and we reconvene at, uh, well, for me it would be uh, 4.30. Uh, that's UK time, so you're going to have to do the maths if you're not here. But uh, yeah, I would say 10 minute, 12 minute break. Um, and then we join again for the remaining five talks. Oh, and the creepy robot lady says we're ready to go anyway. So, um, next we have Rowan, who's going to talk about tropical tree diversification. So, if you want to share your screen. Okay. Okay, we can see your screen. <laughs> okay, that's a good start. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here we go. So, can you tell me if everything's yeah. moving all right? Everything's okay. working perfectly. Off you go. <laughs> nice one. Thanks. So, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Rowan Schley, and today I'm going to be presenting a bit of my research, uh, especially the research I'm going to be doing in the next couple of years, which uh, really deals with whether hybridization sort of catalyzed the really rapid and species um, diversification of a group of tropical trees. And more generally, I'm trying to um, figure out whether on a broader scale, whether the sort of very high diversity of tropical tree species um, in the neotropics may have been caused by similar mechanisms. So yeah, my kind of a provocative title is uh, whether these sort of taboo trysts or these um, hybridization events between different species uh, of tropical trees actually drive diversification or are influencing it. So yes, uh, as I'm sure lots of you know, hybridization and polyploidy can be really catalysts of radiations. And this is uh, at least partially because uh, these hybridization events at the base of radiations can generate rapid, uh, rapidly generate variation at a much more uh, rapid rate than mutation alone. And as well as that, polyploidy can cause more or less instantaneous isolation between incipient species. And so a lot of the really incredible diversity of rainforest tree floras comes from these sorts of really rapid radiations. And a sort of more generally, hybridization is quite understudied in uh, rainforest trees, I guess, given the sort of lack of resources or at least the lack of infrastructure. So because of that, I've chosen this uh, great genus Inga as a study system. It's really speciose. Uh, there's about 300 species which came from this rapid radiation. Uh, they're more or less dominant across the neotropics and they're one of the hyperdominant species uh, genera in Amazonia. As well as that, uh, there's quite a little, or at least a little bit of hybrid evidence of hybridization and polyploidy in Inga. And finally, they've got really diverse phenotypes. And one of the most important axes of divergence, one of the most important uh, phenotypic traits of Ingas is that they've got very varied uh, defense chemistry because they're constantly under this onslaught of herbivory in rainforests. And it's this axis of sort of coexistence between different Inga species. And lots of species can occur in sympatry within the same patch of rainforest. So yes, I guess broadly the biggest question of my postdoc is whether hybridization drives diversification in Amazonian trees and particularly in Inga. Uh, and this is sort of split into three questions. The first being whether hybridization actually preceded the radiation and whether it's continuing. Uh, secondly, I wanna look at whether there's evidence of selection and sort of preferential introgression of loci which underlie these chemical defense, lo um, these chemical defense uh, traits in Inga. And then finally, the sort of main question I'm going to be chatting about in this presentation, which relates to Kamers, I guess, is uh, whether sort of these patterns of recurrent polyploidy have uh, promoted diversification with Inga, uh, within Inga. And so in terms of methods, um, first of all, I'm going to be inferring ploi uh, ploidy levels based on existing HybeSeq data sets. Uh, for Inga, which we have about 800 to 1,000 accessions, um, and then hopefully relate this to net diversification rates to get sort of a, an idea of how ploidy might affect uh, diversification. And then I guess importantly for this workshop, uh, I'm going to be aiming to distinguish between the patterns of allo and autopolyploidy in a subset of about 48 species, 
uh, and then use that to estimate uh, the amount of geno uh, divergence between subgenomes using this program Tetna, which I think we're going to hear from Hannes uh, in one of our one of our workshop days. And for that, we're going to generate uh, 30x NovaSeq whole genome sequencing data, which I'm going to hopefully learn how to deal with in this in this workshop. So. And then as well as that, we're gonna be visualizing the ploidy variation, again, uh, with the program, but um, developed by people who run, run this work, uh, workshop, Smudgeplot. So yeah, I guess broadly, uh, how this workshop and why I applied to be part of this workshop is, um, I'm sort of quite early into the project and I'm really keen to get to grips with whole genome data and more generally um, sort of uh, learn how to deal with the whole genome data in a way that's a little bit more tractable. And it seems that KMA methods are a lot more tractable uh, for these huge data sets than maybe some other types of methods. And then as well as that, obviously we're going to be learning about uh, things like Tetma and smudge plots. And so, yeah, I'm particularly keen to learn about all of these, both the precise methods that I'm going to use in this postdoc project, but also uh, hopefully introducing uh, myself to a few new ones and yeah, learning from all of you. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Ron. And uh, definitely, I hope you will address many of these things in the workshop. That's at least what we're aiming for. So mm -hmm. does anybody have any questions about tree diversification? Feel free to speak up or put them in the chat and I'll read them out. No. Oh, so how I've much of the polyploidy variation you have so I'm not sure if you missed, like, do you have like a flow cytometry or a carry type studies that would like give you some sort of boundaries of where it can go? So we've got, uh, for a few of the species, there's existing flow cytometry data, and it seems to be there's uh, tetraploid, a few tetraploid species, and then diploid species as well, ranging in genome size from like uh, one point, I think it's 1.2 to about 2.4 gigabases. Great, that also answers uh, Ronald's question, which is about genome size, <laughs> so <it's> perfect. <laughs> Two birds of one stone. If and you have any other questions, oh, go on, come on. These are the two things we are going to ask every time. Yeah, the point <laughs> yeah that's the genome size. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but if you have any other questions for Ron, just uh, hit him up on Slack and I'm sure he can answer your questions. So next we'll uh, move on to Sabrina's talk. Sabrina's gonna talk about uh, inbreeding and in endemic ungulates, so. Sabrina, if you want to share your screen, you can take it away. Oh. Um, okay, so I am sharing my screen right now and yep. going to do the presentation mode and going to ask you if you see my presenter view or my presentation view. We see the presentation view, so it looks great. Do okay, you want to okay. try <laughs> moving to the next slide just so we can? Yep, okay. So yeah, I've got some. Yep, excellent. We see those pop up. Okay, cool. Take so, it away. Thank you, Rishi, and thank you for the Ohno organizers for having this workshop and having me here. So my uh, question uh, that probably gonna be uh, assisted with the Kamers approach is: Can we figure out in breeding level from anemic ungulates with the help of their livestock relatives? So this is under the bigger project of my PhD of the conservation genomics of Wallaceae's anemic ungulate. Uh, so these are the ungulates, the babirusa and anoa. Babirusa literally means big deer because it's looking like big, but with it has a like tusk protruding in the upper head, looking like a deer. So that's how the local call them, big deer, uh, babirusa. And Anoa is literally meaning dwarf buffalo because they look like a buffalo, but it's half the size of the common buffalo, just the half of hump, human adult. So it's quite small. Um, yeah, so my, so as any non-model species, when you're looking on the, the genomics, we would like to know if the genomics could help their conservation efforts. They are currently threatened, declined, because in small islands, they usually have a quite huge uh, demand of protein source, uh, and then these is, these are the largest animal there is, and of course the local people hunt them, and they are prone to what we call inbreeding and genetic drift. 
And using genomics, I would like to know how far they are in these two processes. So using SNPs from whole genome sequences, you can get runs of homozygosity. This is the measure of inbreeding extent in a, in a population. Also using, well, because all of you amazing people have doing lots of genome sequences, we are able to do like multi-species whole genome alignment to see if across the tree of life, some position is more conserved than other. And we could see the impact of if certain position is more deleterious than other positions. And this is what uh, look it looks like in runs of homozygosity. So here, I'm just gonna show you uh, where they live. So this is the island where they both live. So Anoa and Babirusa are both living in the Sulawesi island, the key looking island. And then Babirusa is also living in other island called Togian. So that's the smaller one in the north, northern bay in the northern peninsula. But there are not there are no Anoa here. And Anoa is also living in the smaller island of Puton. So this is the smaller island where the Anoa live, but there's no Babirusa here. So this is a quite cool system to understand the evolution of endemic vertebrates because there is two ungulates sharing same habitat in the larger island and the smaller island in different sites like exclusively evolve in isolation. And most of them are found to be inbred. So what you see here is a plot of uh, homozygous regions across the chromosome one for uh, the, the y-axis are the samples. So I got dozens of samples of them and this uh, the x-axis is coordinate of the chromosome one. So these are more or less what we got. The, but but we are doing this by mapping them to a reference genome that are not themselves. So for the Babirusa, we do it with pig reference genome. And for the Anoa, we do it with the cow reference genome. And you can see from these two photos how actually they're quite different, kind of a lot of different. I have a difficult time getting a cow picture that is quite good that because there's a lot of cow breed all across the globe. And we, when you call Bostaurus the cow, there are quite a lot of phenotype, phenotypic variation across the cows. And also that's the case for the pigs. So uh, this is quite a problem for the non-model species. So this is their phylogenetic tree. So the left side is the Babirusa. Uh, Babirusa is quite a unique distinct lineage that already di di diverged from the common ancestor with the Big reference genome about 13 million years ago. So I'm using a genome that are 13 million years apart from the species I'm currently looking at. And for the Anoa, uh, I'm even so they are they are found recently. They are found to be more um, diverged from the water buffalo. So I'm currently uh, are using uh, the last close reference genome. You know? So with the cow, it's also around 10 million years around here. So they're quite uh they're quite far uh in the in relation. So it's a quite a different genome, I expect, but um they actually they map quite well and it's okay. But then it was the variation okay if we want to do like something like a variant detection or more um ex more sophisticated analysis. So and ANOA Interestingly, so while the Babirusa is known to have the same karyotype as the pig, the Anoa is more intriguing as in different zoos all across the globe, they found the karyotype is not consistent. So some zoos reported like they got uh, around 30, some zoos say 40, some zoos say 35. I don't know what makes them different, but Anoa is currently quite di uh, diverse in their genomic uh, variation also, which makes me think, the Kamer approach probably uh, could help me to be more confident about the results that I'm currently getting around the inbreeding level of these two species with the assistance of the relative reference genome. Uh, recently, I came up to this, uh, to this paper by Prasad et al. Evaluating the role of reference genome phylogenetic distance, which is actually the problem I'm currently having. And they say, in the abstract, if you will Google this uh, on your own, there is a, they say that at minimum 3 million years apart from the reference, you will expect a difference in um, in breeding level and, uh, but for the PSMC uh, and other, other kinds of, other kinds of analysis, they said it's okay, but 
uh, for what I'm currently looking at the runs of homozygosity, it will differ quite a lot. So, and this is um, currently understand trying to understand this paper, which says they are using something a Kamer based method in their paper. So we, so I'm hoping to get um, to understand what are the possibilities of Kamers in making me more confident of my results here. So yeah, that's everything for me. Uh, these are the names and institution that's involved. It's quite a big project. That's why I got lots of genomes around. And with that, I'm gonna end my talk and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Serena. That was great. Um, does anybody have any questions? Either in the chat or speak up. No, if not, you can always, as I said a million times now, you can message on Slack. Um, we'll move forward. So we have uh, Laura talking about the genomes of hybrid triploid parthenogens. We, we, do, have, oh. we do have a question. In the oh, we have one question. Sorry, if yeah. we have a question. Where, where is it? It says, what genome sizes are we talking about? Oh, no, that was for the previous talk, I think. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. for the previous talk. <laughs> Sorry. I think. Uh, so yeah, so Lara, if you want to uh, share your slides, go ahead. Yeah, sure. And then, does it work? Yeah, we see it. Do you want to try moving forwards and then we, yeah, extra yeah. certain. Perfect. <laughs> Take okay, it away. Good. So, <laughs> hi, my name is Laura uh, and I'm a master's student at the University of Cologne. And I will talk to you today about what I've been doing during my master's. So in general, it's working on comparing genomes of hybrid triploids, triploid parthenogens with those of their sexual and diploid sister species. So I wanted to quickly mention why I'm interested in nematodes, where they have been reported in every continent and they can either be free living or parasitic. When they are parasitic, they can be parasiting both animals and plants. And when they are free living, they can live, for instance, in soil or water bodies, and they have really important ecological roles, being, for instance, decomposers or food for higher trophic levels. And as I mentioned, they can be found mostly everywhere, which means it also includes uh, extreme areas such as deserts or even Antarctica. And one of the reasons why it is believed that they can thrive on such environments is because of the possibility of reproducing asexually, which then leaves out the twofold cost of sex and also there's no need to find a mating partner, which brings us to the different ways on how nematodes can reproduce. So they can reproduce sexually through amphimixis or being hermaphroditic or through partenogenesis, which is asexual reproduction. And interestingly enough, the genus that I work with, Panagrolimus, is the only nematode genus where all three types of reproduction are found. And this highlights a question which is if sexual reproduction is ubiquitous amongst animals and asexual reproduction is believed to be a dead end either because of the accumulation of deleterious mutations the loss of transposable elements of or the loss of heterozygosity then why is it so persistent in some lineages and yeah how are other taxa challenging this ideas that we have about asexual reproduction yeah, so what I've been working on and what I will work on is on the estimation of mutation rates, some population analysis and genome assembly under the supervision of Philip Schiffer and Anne-Marie Baldfogel, both from the University of Cologne. So what I've done so far is, for instance, obtain mutation rates for an asexual strain and a sexual strain of Panagolimus nematodes, where we found a tendentially lower rate for the asexually reproducing one, which could, for instance, mean that there is no clonal interference when a beneficial mutation arises. However, our asexual strain is an allopolyploid, which means it's 3n equals 12, which brings a lot of questions about how we analyze our data. So we believe that maybe ploidy is aiding the maintenance of heterozygosity and preventing Mueller's Richard. But our results as for now have all been obtained, assuming that the data is deployed because of the tools that we have implemented. So yeah, we need to see how we can deal with this. And additionally, we've been looking and I will be looking on the upcoming weeks as at the population analysis of different Panagolimus strains 
that reproduce again sexually or asexually and they have been isolated from different regions across the globe and what we want to see is how similar they are between each other or how different they are and for this i will continue doing some analysis assuming it is pooled data and uh, why I am interested in KMERS is because we will obtain new sequencing data from several panagolagmus strains that have different reproduction modes. And this will be third generation sequencing. And this brings a lot of questions for me because I've never done genome assembly. So I don't know exactly how to get an accurate estimation of the genome size, how to do this when I have a triploid nematode. And I've played around a bit with old data and using KMER based tools, but I would like to understand the background of them to better understand my results. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Excellent talk. Yeah, that is a, sounds like a very tricky problem, but hopefully you can uh, make some <laughs> steps towards solving it. Um, are there yeah, any more specific questions? <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> any, any questions from anybody? Go on, Carmel. Oh, uh, I know about three sequencing runs of Panagorimus because I analyzed them all. Uh, do you have any mm -hmm. other additional data or do you still like work with the crappy Illumina libraries that exist? No, no, we're getting now Hi-Fi and hi C reads of several strains. Oh wait, you, you're getting or you have? We're getting them. So I did the DNA extraction and we send this out for oh, sequencing. Right. All right, right. So, so I will get the data. No, no, it's just that I, I, I've seen the, the libraries and they were done in like very old techniques and they have, have a huge coverage variance. So I, I was just wondering if you're like trying to rest all the data or like trying to figure out how to do it now. I think all, all is good. Like if you're getting new sequencing, I'm very happy. Yeah, because everything else I've done is with Illumina Reads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we actually, that's for everyone. We will have uh, the Panagrolimus schema spectra for everybody to analyze. So you will see what Laura is working with. Excellent. Any, if there's not any more questions, we can move on. Uh, so next we have uh, Ronald, who'll be talking about leak genomics. So Ronald, if you wanna share your screen, that would be great. Okay. Yes, mandatory question. Do you see it and does it work? <laughs> we see it, yeah. <laughs> uh, so far, it's not. Ah, yes, it seems there to be. There we do. Yeah, we see it okay. all. So off you go. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Ron Nieuwenhuis. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands and um, I'm working on leak genomics, uh, which is another giant genome. Uh, recently, we have seen a lot of. Uh, big genomes being uh, published, so this is another one. Um, sh short bit about me, so it's not as fundamental as most of other uh, attendees of this uh, workshop, but um, uh, I'm a master's student still at uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands, uh, but next to that I'm also a, a technician uh, at Wageningen Research, uh, so that's a bit different from Wageningen University. It's a bit more commercial, but uh, in the Applied Bioinformatics group, we uh, have the core sequencing facility of the university. And uh, we have a, a ton of uh, uh, machines producing all kinds of data, uh, including SQL2, NovaSeq, uh, optical mapping, all these kinds of stuff. Um, and I work on all the different projects that we get, uh, but mostly uh, we work on plant genomes. Uh, so a few big uh, uh, projects we did were on uh, pepper, tomato, melon, uh, resequencing 100 lines, uh, looking for diversity, all these kinds of things. Um, and the latest uh, project now is working on the lead genome. So we uh, um, are in a public-private partnership, uh, partnership. So we work together with plant breeding uh, companies and also the government is funding 50% uh, uh, of this project. Um, and the goal for this was because we are talking about such a, a big genome to just get a SNP array, um, because that should be already of big help to the breeders. But um, 
since we obtained the uh, the SQL two, we we have seen uh, massive improvements uh, with the HiFi uh, technique. So we decided to also uh, go for a genome assembly now. And one of the many things we see when we're working together with breeders is that uh, they are often very convinced on what kind of uh, genomes they are dealing with, and then. Uh, during the, the, the data production and handling, we see that, um, well, we don't know that much actually. And in league, this is uh, not so much the case. It's quite clear. Uh, it's an auto tetrapoid of um, uh, around 15 gigs, uh, one and uh, genome size. Um, but if we um, uh, assemble this, we get once again, a, a usually inflated genome of around 80 gigs um, with, with very low coverage actually. Um, so by uh, implementing all these KMER tools, um, uh, we see of course a lot of peaks and all these kinds of things. Um, and it's really hard to explain them to our customers. Um, so that's basically what I would like to get from this uh, workshop actually. So, so to get more insights in the genome and to be able to explain it. So uh, we already uh, rely very heavily on Genome Scope 2 and Smudge Plot in our uh, uh, basic pipelines, um, but we're moving towards polyploid genomes more and more, um, also allopolyploid, so we would like to extract subgenomes. Um, yeah, so that, that's what we are focusing at, and, and uh, I think this is one nice example of, um, of uh, uh, a problem case, let's say, where the, the model simply doesn't converge. Uh, so the model is the, the, the black line uh, and it doesn't converge to the blue background. Um, so, so all these kinds of issues, they, they pop up very often and uh, it's up to me to explain them to, to other scientists and uh, uh, plant breeders. But I, I, I have a hard time and I would like to get some more um, experience on that. So yeah, that's basically it. Excellent. Thanks for that. That's an eye-wateringly large genome. I hope uh, I hope Kema has helped you figure it out a little bit. Does anybody have any specific questions for Roland? No. Any in the chat? Okay. In that case, we thank Ronald. And we move on to our last talk of the Flash Talk. So thank you all for being so patient. So we have uh, Pauline. He's going to talk about the phylogenomics of Oleaceae. So, oh, there we go. We're already ahead of the game. <laughs> Perfect. We see it. I think you might be muted. We might have a for our second. Uh, are you muted of the of the workshop? Ah, yep. Yeah, there we go. We hear you. Uh, take it away. Uh, I'm Pauline. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toulouse in France, and I'm working on phylogenomic of Oleaceae. And while you are, may not be familiar with the name Oleaceae, you are probably familiar with uh, some of the species it contains. So lilac, jasmine, uh, ash trees, and the most iconic one, the olive tree. And if you are not lucky enough to live in uh, hot places when you can find olive, uh, you may still uh, encounter some oleaceae because they are widespread uh, in all uh, kind of climates, temperate or tropical. And in my group, we are working on the biogeography of uh, this family. And in this context, I wonder what I can do uh, using camera to to analyze more than uh, organic genomes, as we have a lot, a lot of uh, genome skewing da data for the whole family. And we also have some polyploids in, uh, in the family, so I'm wondering if I can find a way to uh, use the nuclear data for this species, which I'm trying to avoid too for now, but maybe Camer can help you with that. Um, and also, uh, oh, I can improve some draft assembly using Camer. So apparently, I will find out during this talk, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, and also my main interest for my PhD is a uh, uh, cell phone compatibility system in uh, Oleaceae. So in this family, we have a really unique system of uh, cell phone compatibility. Uh, so 
as uh, you probably know, <laughs> even know plant people, uh, most plants are hermaphrodites as they have the male and female organ in the same on the same structure, the flower. And um, so it brings up some problems uh, to uh, <laughs> so-called um, inbreeding inflation. And so they developed several ways to avoid um, to avoid the self a selfing. Uh, and uh, uh, Surabi already talked about you about uh, flexi stylus. And in Olasi, we have uh, heterostylus uh, species as a most central state, apparently. And heterostylus is the coexistence of two groups that are com uh, intergroup compatible and not intergroup, um, one with short style and some with uh, long style. And they can only uh, pollinate with species from the opposite group. So, as I'd say, it's an uh, ancestral state in the family. And then there has been a polyploidization event. And after that, we lo completely lost uh, heterostyle and just remained with a bialylic uh, genetic incompatibility, which is uh, really peculiar in, uh, in all plants family because uh, usually. This system will uh, diversify over time uh, through um, the negative uh, frequency dependent selection. And in the case of Odyssey, this system has maintained for more than 40 million years ago. Uh, 40 million years. Uh, so uh, there, must, there must be a really specific architecture uh, that prevents the, uh, the invasion by new alleles. And uh, we are trying to find that, but for now, we have really few idea about the uh, genetic determinism of um, of uh, heterostyle and also uh, self incompatibility system in Odyssey. So that's what I'm trying to work on for my PhD. And we think it might be uh, a structure like a super gene, which will be really divergent between the two groups, uh, the two alleles. So maybe I can use some camera method that people use on uh, sex part chromosome and things like that to, to uh, discriminate some of the uh, group-specific camera and try to identify some uh, linked uh, sequences. And that's all for me. Thank you. Great. Thanks again, Pauline. And uh, any questions about the Oliesi or um, I have a question. Um, <laughs> uh, so in, uh, I'm sure you know, in uh, Primula, it's um, hemizygosity of the, the S locus. Uh, is there any similar hypothesis here for? That's just one of your hypotheses, but for me. Okay, so you're, okay, so you're not. Yeah, it's probably similar to, to Primula. <laughs> any other questions? I'm not sure if I just missed it, but uh, how long time ago the polyploidization even have happened? Uh, 40 million years ago. 40 million years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's really at the base of the family. And there uh, so was you... another one at the base of the family yeah. like, before. So there have been two polyploidization events in the family. And then we have yes. some polyploids on some lineages inside of. So do you imagine that the super gene you suppose you might find there have evolved during that polyploidization event or uh, uh, in the individual lineages independently? Uh, we think it's a single origin because the groups are um, interspecies compatible. So apparently there's the same genetic determinism in all species in the, mm -hmm. in the core, core group uh, with the green uh, <laughs> But that would mean that the two copies of the super gene would be presumably 40 million years diverged from each other. Yeah. And what's the generation time? Uh, it's really dependent of the species. Hmm. We, we don't really know that. No, it's, it's a really interesting system. I think we might uh, try to find a way how to fish for it. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Any more questions? If not, I would just like to thank again all of our speakers. Thank you all 10 of you for uh, 
stepping up when we started to panic a little bit uh, about having people giving these flash talks. They've all been really great. And uh, 